We spent a fair amount of time talking about various systems and their thermodynamics, and in particular we focused on the ideal gas. What I want to do is talk a little bit about gas properties here and then expand our consideration to gases that may not necessarily be ideal. One of the properties that we find in gases is that they are both compressible and expansive. And this is untrue of solids and liquids. So if I were to characterize solids and liquids, I would say that they are not very compressible or expansive. That is to say, it's very difficult to get them to change their volume by exerting pressure or changing the temperature. So in this case, we're really talking about gases. Now, for an ideal gas, we can easily compute what these things are because we have a, an equation of state. Okay, and I'm going to do this for molar quantities. So this equation of state tells us very directly if I change, uh, for example, the pressure somehow, what effect that will have on the volume if I have a constant temperature. Or if I keep the pressure constant and I change the temperature, how will that change the volume? All right, so let, let's, uh, how would we write this? Well, in the case of changing the pressure, I might be interested in how the volume changes as I change the pressure holding the temperature constant. But I could use the ideal gas equation of state to simply find that this is going to be equal to negative RT over P squared. All right. Notice that it's negative because as I increase the pressure, I'm decreasing the volume. I could similarly do this for changing the temperature while holding the pressure constant, and that would give me a, an equation that looks like this, All right, where I've simply used the ideal gas equation of state and taken these uh, very simple partial derivatives to determine this. But what if I don't have an ideal gas? And in fact, if, if I'm dealing with a gas in the laboratory, I don't necessarily know in advance if it's going to uh, strictly obey the ideal gas equation of state. If it's very dilute, it might, but it may not. Well, for this purpose, we've defined a couple of uh, special parameters that tend to be um, measured and then can be used in other measurements. First of these is the isothermal compressibility. Okay, now what exactly does that tell us? Well, compressibility is implying that we're changing the pressure to affect the volume. Isothermal tells us that we're holding the temperature constant. Well, that looks a lot like this derivative. And indeed, we would define the isothermal compressibility. We use this symbol, and the subscript T tells us that it's isothermal, to relate these quantities to this partial derivative. Now, in this case, we're, we're not necessarily assuming that we have a molar volume or uh, that we know the number of moles of volume. So we're going to create an intensive variable out of this by, sorry, by dividing by the volume. So this makes this an intensive variable or an intensive constant. Now, I'm also noting that, remember, this had a minus sign in front. So I'm going to put a minus sign out here so that I have a positive variable. So this is going to be something that's greater than zero that I can tabulate. And now I have a way of uh, basically um, cataloging what the compressibility of a given gas is uh, from a measurement that I've made in the laboratory. Another one of these quantities that we sometimes look at is the isobaric. Remember, isobaric means constant pressure. Thermal expansivity. All right, and this one we give the symbol alpha. Lots of things get the symbol alpha in science. And it's going to be related now to the change in volume when I change the temperature. And remember, when we change the temperature, we increase the volume. So this is a thing that's greater than zero over here. This is done at constant pressure. That's what the isobaric tells us. And again, we're going to scale it by the volume of the substance that we have so that it becomes an intensive variable that can be uh, tabulated for various things. And again, as I've noted, it's greater than zero. So the whole idea is we're defining these quantities, the isothermal compressibility and the isobaric thermal expansivity, as properties of real gases. Um, if they were ideal, they're easy to compute, Okay, which we've given up here and up here. 
um, but they may not be ideal, so having these tabulated gives us a way of making further measurements on these gases. Now, these also are helpful in um, uh, relating them to uh, other partial derivatives that we may not know for a given gas. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose I am interested in how the pressure changes with temperature at constant volume for a gas. It turns out that I can relate this to these two quantities in some very interesting ways. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to first understand a couple of properties of, um, of partial derivatives. I think the first of these is something I'll call the reciprocal property. And what I want to note here is the particular instance in which I have three variables. I've got volume, pressure, and temperature that are all related by an equation of state. Okay, so they all are related to one another through that equation of state, which means that I can take partial derivatives of one with respect to the other and hold the third one constant. And there's actually going to be relationships between those different partial derivatives. The reciprocal relationship is one that tells me that if I have something like, like this one is dp dt at constant volume, that in fact that is going to be equal to the reciprocal, the one over the reciprocal of that derivative. So that's going to be dt dp at constant volume. So notice that I've just flipped the numerator and the denominator of this partial derivative and put it in the denominator. So this is an easy way, I think, to, uh, to make some of these relationships work because we can simply flip it around and put it in the denominator and we get an equivalent expression. These two are, in fact, equivalent expressions. Another one is something called a cyclic permutation. And I need to be very careful in writing this out because it's easy to make mistakes. All right, so I've got uh, a partial derivative dp dt at constant volume. What if I were to multiply this by two other partial derivatives? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cyclically permute these three variables in, this, in these partial derivatives. So the next one I'll go, I'll put dt on top, partial derivative of temperature with respect to volume. So I've moved the constant thing into the denominator, and I've moved the numerator down to be the thing that's constant. So I'm multiplying the partial derivative of pressure with respect to temperature at constant volume times the partial derivative of temperature with respect to volume at constant pressure. Now I'm going to do this one more time, so it's a cyclic permutation. So now I'm going to have the dv dp at constant temperature. And it turns out that when I include all three of these cyclic permutations together, their product is equal to minus 1. It's really magical, isn't it? It turns out this is not very difficult to prove, but I'm not going to ask you to prove it. I just want you to believe that <laughs> this is true. And we're going to use this relationship to see what we can learn about this particular derivative. Now, one of the things that I could do is I could, uh, I could, um, uh, take, the, I could take two of these and move them over to the right-hand side and, and make it a reciprocal relationship. So I might have dp dt at constant volume is equal to negative 1 over these things, dt dv at constant pressure times dv dp at constant temperature. But then I can use the reciprocal relationship. And in this case, I'm only going to use the reciprocal relationship on this one. So I can also write this derivative as negative of dv dt at constant pressure over dv dp at constant temperature. All right, now all I've done here is I've taken this cyclic permutation. I have moved two of them to the right-hand side by using the reciprocal relationship. And then I've made the reciprocal relationship further on one of them to make us a, 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 a ratio of these two partial derivatives. So magically, I can take my original partial derivative and write it as negative times the ratio of these two partial derivatives. Now I realize that this looks like magic and it probably doesn't make much sense until you go through and prove it to yourselves. But uh, algebraically, I'll just note that uh, if, if I were doing algebra, I would uh, rearrange this thing here to put the denominator up on top and the dv's would cancel, and I'd end up with something that looks like a dp dt. So algebraically, you should be able to follow it. The thing that's 
crate that you have to be careful about though is what is the parameter that's being held constant in each of these. All right, but now that I have this relationship, this is a very suggestive relationship, and I'll, I'll point out that this first, this first derivative in the numerator is very much like the one that I have here. In fact, it is the same partial derivative. The one that's down here in the denominator is, in fact, very much like this one here. And I have a minus sign out front, so if I just put that in the denominator, I can now rewrite this as dv dt at constant pressure over negative, and I'm going to leave a little space there, dv dp at constant temperature. And now if I just multiply by 1 over v times 1 over v, what do I have? Well, this thing is just the isobaric thermal expansivity, and this thing is just the isothermal compressibility. So in fact, I've been able to show from all of this that my initial derivative here, dp dt at constant volume, is simply equal to the isobaric thermal expansivity divided by the isothermal compressibility. So here we have a case of a derivative for a real gas, and we could evaluate that derivative as if it were an ideal gas, but if it's not, then if we have tabulated values of these two quantities, it gives us a way to calculate what this derivative is. And that's where the real beauty in using these partial derivatives is, is that we have other ways that we can use to find the information that we want to have for a particular, uh, for a particular system and for a particular measurement.